For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson with another readout video based on our Wednesday Wake Up newsletter. And as part of our doomed effort to seem modern and hip, I want to mention that we actually do look at our social media analytics. And then, like Sam Diamond in Murder by Death, we say to ourselves, That can only mean one thing. And I don't know what it is. On which basis, hello to our viewers in Romania. You apparently have the longest dwell time on our videos of anyone anywhere in the world. Which can only mean one thing. As can a touching New York Times Climate Forward feature on West Windsor, Vermont, rocked by closure of the local ski resort, quote, because of erratic snowfall and mismanagement, end quote, whose plucky inhabitants apparently responded by creating, quote, a model for how a small ski area and its community can thrive in the era of climate change, end quote. The one thing it can mean is that the troubles of West Windsor have nothing whatsoever to do with climate change. And, another perhaps, the troubles of the media have everything to do with making ridiculous claims driven by zealotry. Never mind picking nits about the Times referring to a 2019 study that was actually published in 2017. We'll leave that stuff to the fact checkers, if you take my meaning, and we'll cut straight to the piece. The Times describes one enthusiastic skier at the tip-top of local Mount Escutney pointing to other snow-covered peaks with flourishing ski resorts and lamenting that more than a decade ago they would get lots of snow and it would, quote, just bypass Escutney, end quote, and therefore West Windsor. So unless you think the effects of climate change really hit around 2008, the premise of the whole story is bunk. As it would be anyway, because this change in snowfall apparently only affected one in five local mountains, despite being, what's that word, global. Then, being modern and hip, we looked on Wikipedia for the actual numbers, and it turns out that West Windsor itself now gets a mere 76 inches of snow a year, doubtless baffling local children whenever it falls in a thick white blanket every year. But a resort inexplicably located on Mount Escutney, home of the failed resort, boasts that, quote, Alpine skiers have been thrilled about Escutney's varied terrain and friendly appeal for over 60 years, end quote, before inviting you to experience eight trails, 26 acres of skiable terrain for all ability levels, end quote, including a run of 3,100 feet. And by the way, we also Googled to be certain, and Alpine isn't a creative climate era alternative to downhill skiing. It is downhill skiing. So, Escutney still has downhill skiing a decade after climate change wiped it out. And Wikipedia reports that one of its hated rivals, Killington Mountain Resort and Ski Area, also known as the Beast of the East, in the era of climate change, has a mere 155 runs, with just 21 lifts, barely able to get 37,000 people per hour up the mountain to enjoy its feeble 10 feet of snow. And if it still sounds bare and rocky, nearby Okimo Mountain Resort gets 16.6 feet of snow a year. And if you're not thinking, whoa, that's too much snow, well, Mount Sunapi gets just 8 feet of the stuff, but somehow maintains 66 runs, while a fourth local competitor, Stratton Mountain, has 99 runs and 15 feet of snow. But what about poor climate ravaged Escutney? What's this? Over 16 feet of snow a year? Nearly three times the Ottawa average? And yet the Times runs two related stories on how climate change shut it down? And in case it didn't, quote, a 2019 study showed that in northeastern states besides Vermont, at least half of ski areas will close by the mid-2050s if high greenhouse gas emissions continue, end quote. And to think people sometimes doubt the urgency of the climate crisis or the reliability of the media. Speaking of which, in the newsletter, we also mock a National Geographic story asking, will we lose coffee because of climate change, end quote, partly because the answer to all those rhetorical headline questions is no, including this one, but also because it thinks we might get a bit less, more cashews and avocados, and the coffee will probably be grown in different places because farmers adapt before warning us that, while well, yes, agricultural yields have increased in Nebraska, less due to innovation than to milder weather, quote, the problem is, as the heat keeps rising, the weather in Nebraska is unlikely to remain as mild, end quote. Someone is losing their sense of perspective, and we think we know who. As the newsletter also points out, climate alarmists chasing the dragon of the high they get from panicking the public don't just have scientists say or warn anymore, now they are, quote, stunned by climate nihilism, end quote. And the Daily Telegraph calls Antarctica, quote, a territory increasingly ravaged by climate change, end quote. Ravaged, despite it actually cooling lately, to the point that a 2014 expedition that wanted to retrace Antarctic exploration to show how it's so much warmer ended up encased in ice and begging for rescue. 
And now, a word from our sponsor. And that's you. Because at the Climate Discussion Nexus, we're dependent upon support from our viewers and our readers. Please go to our donate page, make a one-time pledge, or if you can, a monthly one. I'm not talking a lot of money, though. If you've got it, we'll take it. $2 a month, $3, $5. That's the sustaining funding that we need to produce these videos on our newsletter. And now, back to me. Then there's that wired piece we cited last week, quote, because land is heating so quickly, increasingly frequent and intense heat waves are brutalizing people living in different parts of the world, end quote. Heating. Brutalized. Past the thesaurus. No, wait, it's on fire. And the dragon chasing isn't just rhetorical. Extinction Rebellion believes it's going to create a massive revolt in Britain on April Fool's Day. But it'll be too late, because Greta Thunberg has scheduled the revolution for March 25. Quote, Join us and strike for climate reparations and justice. Demand that the people in power prioritize people, not profit. Well, that's original. But you see, now it's not enough of a thrill just to save the planet from greenhouse gases. Oh no. Quote, the catastrophic climate scenario that we are living in is the result of centuries of exploitation and oppression through colonialism, extractivism, and capitalism, an essentially flawed socioeconomic model that urgently needs to be replaced, end quote. Extractivism. Terrible. But it gets worse. We need these reparations, after shutting down the energy industries that would enable anyone to afford them, quote, not as charity, but as a transformative justice process in which political power will return to the people, end quote. Workers of the world unite. Really, quote, climate struggle is class struggle. For years, the ruling class, primarily through corporations and governments from the global north, dominated by affluent white heterosexual cis males, have exercised their power, gained through colonialism, capitalism, patriarchy, white supremacy, and exploitation, to destroy the earth and its occupants with no remorse, end quote. Yeah, and no editor. Meanwhile, in the Hill Times, a news story shared a pollster's lament that, quote, one in four respondents still do not accept that climate change is a fact and mostly caused by humans, end quote. Which is lazy, since as many humans, including ourselves, have explained repeatedly, it's precisely because we know just how much climate has always changed that we doubt people suddenly started making it do so. But never mind facts. Quote, why aren't we acting more decisively to confront climate change when we know it's a threat to humanity, end quote, wails the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices. Uh, because we don't know any such thing and neither do you? Say, that one was easy. Ask us another. Okay, Reuters reports that the UN Secretary General recently demanded we crank global governance up to 11, since evidently whatever that thing is that meets in New York to the world government that he presides over hasn't been doing enough. Quote, we must go into emergency mode and put out this five-alarm fire, Guterres said. End quote. Nice dragon you're chasing there, buddy. But if the UN's such a dud, what's going to replace it? Communism or something. Quote, he branded the global financial system morally bankrupt, end quote, and then he demanded an avalanche of action. Maybe he should go to Mount Escutney, because they've got all this snow. But no, he's going to end alienation declaiming, quote, technology shouldn't use us, we should use technology, end quote. And after lunch, world peace, quote, he pledged to spare no effort to mobilize the international community and step up our push for peace, as he said the world faced the highest number of violent conflicts since 1945. This world is too small for so many hotspots, said Guterres, end quote. Well, it's kind of hard to make it bigger, so we suppose he has some plan to cool down the global hotspots that has eluded all previous sages and statesmen like a carbon tax to be forced on China by uh, whatever replaces the UN and actually works. You see how simple it all is? And speaking of simple, Canada's government has produced blazing red-hot maps to show us the effects of warming on the Great White North. But before you throw your sunscreen and flip-flops into the suitcase, here's the actual temperature in Cape Dorset, Nunavut, for January, starting in 1927. Yeesh. And here's February and March. Though, to be fair, with the sunset views over Hudson Strait, you might want to pack some sunglasses with that parka. And speaking of sun, there was a time in decades past when people assumed that the sun played a leading role in climate change. After all, something caused the mid-Holocene thermal optimum, the Roman warm period, the late lamented medieval warm period, and the Little Ice Age. And it wasn't us. But then along came greenhouse gas theory and out went the sun because the UN's IPCC decided that solar variations were too small on their own to account for global temperature changes. And that would be true unless there was some mechanism to amplify solar changes. 
some sort of mechanism of the sort they certainly believe amplifies changes in atmospheric CO2. For the Sun, a leading candidate was the Svensmark effect, where small increases in solar energy suppress cloud formation by screening out cosmic rays, and fewer clouds of a certain sort means more warming. And late last year, Fizz.org reported on a new analysis of satellite data published in Nature Scientific Reports that found evidence for the link. Lead author Henrik Svensmark, yes, of the Svensmark effect, cautions that the results don't explain away climate change, but they do put the Sun back into the picture. Seems climate is complicated. It's so complicated that a piece from the CO2science.org archive from before the recent wildfires in Australia said computer models predict more wildfires in Australia, but it's not actually getting more wildfires. Then there's one bad year, and things have gone back to normal. So much for that scare story. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, and we fact-check the media.